So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, intro to uh, Piximi tutorial. Um, my name is Esteban. I'm a postdoctoral associate at Beth Simini's lab in, at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And today I will be talking to you about Piximi. Uh, so I think uh, most of you already have seen this, but just again in case. Um, we will be using uh, Pixime, which is a, a web application. So you don't need to install anything. You just need to go to this link, pixime.app. Um, and also uh, you can find here at the link uh, that I will uh, paste again in the chat uh, for those of you who just joined. Um, you can find these slides that I'm going to be showing you as well as the images that we'll use for the uh, for the tutorial in that link. Um, so without further ado, uh, what is Pixime? Um, it, it's very, it'll make sense if many of you haven't heard about Pixime before. It's a rather uh, new tool. I think uh, last year was the, the first presentation in society of the tool in here in virtual I2K. Um, Pixime is an um, image analysis web app that allows you to use uh, deep learning methods and, and models without any programming required. Um, it is, and this is a, a, a disclaimer that you will probably hear uh, several times, very much under construction. So it's under active development, but it's already available to be used and it already has uh, quite a few um, very interesting and very useful functionalities that you can uh, take advantage of. Um, uh, the core functionalities or the, the core um, uh, things that you can do with Pixime uh, is to annotate images, uh, to perform segmentation using uh, different um, machine learning and deep learning um, models, uh, classify those images, again, using uh, different available models or some that you can train yourself, and uh, then perform measurements. Um, this tool is uh, was created by the by Beth Simini's lab in particular, uh, uh, on, and currently, uh, been maintained and developed by uh, Nodar Gogorbice and Andrea Papalio. Uh, so just uh, before we, we jump into this, let's see if I can, you still see my screen, right? I will be uh, going back and forth. Yeah, thank you. I will be going back and forth uh, from the presentation to the app to just show you. Um, now I'll be uh, doing a very general um a tour of the uh, of the app and then the idea is for us to uh go over uh the um, the tutorial exercise together uh to to show you some of the things that you can do so when you open Pixime, this is what you'll hear uh, and i encourage you to if you have uh double screens or if you can like put the this uh, window side to side with a with a, a web browser uh, to follow along and and explore uh, as as I'm showing you. Um, you will see that it already has a pre-trained image. Uh, uh, sorry, a, a preloaded uh, image here as an example. Um, here you have the options of uh, uploading of generating uh, a new project. Uh, opening new new images uh, or uh, opening an existing project and of course saving um these are two of the 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 areas uh the the functionalities that i mentioned the classification and segmentation and here are the other two the annotation and measurements for this, you need to uh, select at, at least one of the images, and we can go into uh, the annotation. You will see that this preloaded image has already been uh, manually annotated. And so you have here what uh, categories, what kinds 
of objects have been annotated in this image. We have a uh, cell membrane, which we can turn on and off with these little eye icons, and the nuclei uh, for the cells. Uh, we will play a little more around the annotator later, but this is just so uh, we have an, an idea of where things uh, lay. Um, of course, we can uh, zoom in and out of the images see if we want a little more detail. Uh, and here we can select all or none of the images. Now with only one image, it doesn't make much sense, but when we have more, you'll see that this is very useful. Um, and so I think that's the, the main things. Let's go back to the presentation and, uh, see what we are going to be working with, uh, today. So we are going to be using, uh, some images coming from human U2OS, uh, osteosarcoma cells, uh, in which, uh, a specific protein, FOXO1A, has been labeled with GFP. And so this protein um, normally localizes in the, in the cytoplasm and is constantly moving in and out of the nucleus. It's uh, moving in uh, uh, and, and the, the export from the, the nucleus to the cytoplasm is active. So this drug warming in which we are going to be treating the cells with inhibits this export from the nuclei to, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm so basically uh makes it so that foxo1a uh, and thus the 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 fluorescent the green fluorescent label uh that it has is accumulated in the nucleus so uh, we'll have these U2OS cells treated with different uh, with different doses of warmenin, and our task here will be to determine which is the lowest dose possibly to observe uh, this effect. So we are uh, studying the translocation of this uh, protein that was labeled with with GFP. Uh, this is the the context. So that what we will be going to do makes sense. So. Um, if you have the uh, these slides, uh, you can continue checking them out in case you you get lost. But I will do this uh, in the browser. So the first thing that we need to do, since uh, we already have uh, an image on a, on a project loaded, will be to create uh, a new project. We can, you can name it whatever you want. I will name it Piximi tutorial. And yes, this is a live demo. And so that makes me very anxious and very nervous. I hope everything goes okay. But if it doesn't, you know, live demos, uh, something sometimes go that way. So now that we have our new blank um, project, we will open uh, the project zip file that you should have downloaded from the, the link in the chat. So let's go with this. Mine is in uh, downloads. This Piximi translocation tutorial rgb.zip. And as it loads, well, this was quite, uh, quite fast. It's not that many images, but you see that uh, you can see the progression uh, of uh, the loading here. Um, I would uh, very much like it if you can react by uh, raising your hand uh, or like giving me a thumbs up rather uh, if you have uh, if you were successful in loading the images and following along with me or you can also do a thumbs down uh, or just open your mic if you have uh, any issues. Um, so in this case, we are not only loading the, the images, um, but also you can see that the images already have a, a color label that if you hover with your mouse over it, uh, it is assigned uh, a number. And so these are the categories that uh, the images were pre label with, uh, which correspond to the doses. So we are we have images that go from uh, zero nanomolar warmenin 
up all the way up to 150 uh, nanomolar warming. You will see also here in the categories how many images we have in each category. So we have four for 150, four for zero, which are our negative and positive controls respectively. Uh, and then just one for all the other uh, doses. We purposefully kept the number of uh, images low so that the processing and every all the steps that we are going to do uh, are done quicker. But of course, you can have more. In case you want to create uh, a new category, it is as easy as clicking here in new category, assigning a name, and you will see this category appear. And then you can uh, click on an image and using the categorize option, assign it to the new category. Yeah, I will take this one back. Uh, so, but that's basically what we did uh, prior to this workshop. We assigned, we had the metadata from for these images uh, knowing uh, which dose of warming was uh, each each uh, uh, culture was treated with, and we just performed the same thing that I just showed you uh, on every one of them. Um, now that we have our uh, our images loaded, uh, the first thing that we will want to do is to segment the cells to find each and every instance of a cell in each of these um, images. There are different ways to do that. One way would be to do a manual annotation. Of course, that will be uh, very troublesome, but doing manual annotation has its benefits. You can use that as ground truth for later training your own, uh, your own models. So uh, if we wanted to uh, annotate these images one by one, uh, I could I can select all the images using this select all, then go to the annotator. And here you see that all the images that I selected are uh, loaded into the annotator. I can select whichever. Um, here you have all the different tools from the annotator. I will just lock them so they don't move around that much. Um, if you have a mouse, you can uh, scroll with your mouse in and out for, for Zoom or just use this Zoom tool. Um, and we have several different, uh, oh yeah, you can adjust the, the channels. Uh, in this case, even though we only have two channels in the image, one for the nuclei as a DAPI channel and one for the GFP that um, labels are protein of interest. Uh, this is an RGB image. Uh, this was on purpose since some uh, of the, especially the segmentation uh, tools that we have available require an RGB image and, and we will see that. So here you can see that the green channel, we can turn it on and off corresponds to the, the GFP. But the nuclei are actually in a duplicate channel. It's both green and blue. And that's why it's, uh, it looks magenta, which also is um, a much more friendly color palette for colorblind people. Um, so for segmenting, we have different tools. You can do simple uh, geometrical selections like rectangles uh, or circles or polygons. Uh, but you also have some other tools like the lasso, for example, which will uh, help you go around uh, an image and select it. And, oh, sorry, since I haven't created any kind, um, yeah, this for labeling first, I need to create kind. So because I, ha I haven't, I can create it right now. So. Yeah, so now I have a, a kind that is called nucleus. If I have different types of nuclei, I can uh, 
also name them and I can hit confirm. There are uh, other tools. One that I particularly like is the color tool. So if you click somewhere and then keep the keep clicking and drag and drop, it will create a threshold based on color. And in this case, these two nuclei were, were touching, but it makes it quite simple to just do the annotations. Of course, we don't want to uh, do all these annotations manually. This was uh, just to, to show you a little bit about how you can do it. This is uh, quite useful because PixieMe being a web app is compatible with tablets. So if you have uh, difficult images that you had no choice by to uh, annotate by hand, or you want to get ground truth data for training your own model, um, this is a, a, a great easy way to do it with no uh, no installation requires. For now, I will just delete this because we are going to see if we have a, a better way of doing the segmentation. Uh, I will pause here. Uh, yes, I will discard because I, I don't care about this. Uh, I will pause here for a second uh, and ask you if you are being able to follow along or if you have any questions. Okay. Um, so since I don't want to segment all these cells one by one, I can go into this segmentation section uh, and see if I can use one of the preloaded um, deep learning models uh, to help me. So you go to segmentation, then load model. Uh, and so for now, again, as I mentioned, this uh, PixieMe is very much under development. You can only choose uh, some from the list of pre-trained models, which are these five. Uh, eventually, the idea is for you to be able to upload your own custom module or to fetch uh, a model from uh, a repository or a, like a um, bioimage zoo. Um, for this, we have uh, different models. We have Stardust, uh, both for fluorescent images or for H&E. Uh, we have Coco SD, SSD, which is um, a model that is very useful for natural images uh, detection. Uh, one model that is specifically for detecting uh, or specifically trained to detect glands in uh, histology images. And we also have cell posts. Uh, for each of these models, for example, if I try to use the Stardis Fluo, uh, this model is telling me that it requires a one channel images. So uh, in this case, my images are RGB. So I will not be able to use uh, Stardis Fluo, but we can uh, work with cell posts. When you choose cell posts, you can see that I have a warning uh, pop up here. Uh, informing me that this model is the, the inference for this model is performed on the cloud rather than in my machine. So in most of the processes that we will uh, be performing here in, in Pixime, the computation is actually performed on your local machine. Your The data for your images never leave your computer. Um, in the cases that do, that uh, we in, in the models that are uh, only supported in the cloud, such as cell phones in this case, um, you will have a, a warning saying, OK, be, be careful because the images are leaving your machine. So if there is any kind of sensitive information in your images, uh, it is good that you are well aware uh, that this is happening. In this case, we have no patient data, nothing. Uh, is uh, confidential here, so we have no problem uh, with using cell posts on the cloud. So once you choose your model, you can open segmentation model, and you will see now that uh, I have this um, option available, the predict model button that was grayed out before. In this case, uh, for different uh, models, 
you could also try to train, which is this button, but here it is telling me that this model is inference only, at least for now. Uh, so, okay, we can uh, hit and predict model. You can see that uh, Piximi is thinking and uh, performing the, the prediction. So this is a process that can take uh, a couple of minutes, um, again, this is sending the information to a, a remote server, and it's running the predictions there. Um, you can absolutely leave your, your Piximi tab during this time. You can open a new tab and do something else. What I will say is uh, because how the, um, the browsers, are, in this case, I'm using Chrome, are uh, uh, set up, usually they tend to uh, use less resources for tabs that are not actively open. So if you change your, your uh, tab, uh, that will not stop the process that you started in Piximi, but it might make it uh, slower. Um, and, but here you can see the, uh, the progression. Um, so I will... Again, use this uh, gap to ask you, uh, have you been able to uh, start the, the segmentation using cell posts? Uh, do you have any questions, something that you want me to repeat? Please feel free to open your mic or um, type it into the, the chat. Also, pause for hydration. Thank you, uh, August. I am butchering your name. Sorry if, if so. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Um, one of the things that uh, you can probably uh, start to realize is there is some uh, drawback uh, of being able to run this kind of uh, tasks on the cloud without any installation, and that is performance. Right now, uh, the performance of running inference on a cell post model on Piximi is much slower than running on cell post on your computer. Um, again, there, there is no free lunch. There is also a, a, a price to pay. However, it is very, and you will see, especially when we train uh, a classification model, um, that you can use uh, the the pros of Piximi to your advantage. For for example, training uh, a model with uh, some of your images, and then exporting the model and running the inference, like the bulk of of the the computation, uh, maybe on, on a server or or some uh, some other. Uh, more performing computer. Um, so, okay, in my case, this is just about to be finished. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, okay. So once it, finish, it finishes, you will see that not only the Piximi logo uh, goes back to normal, but also I have a new tab open here, which is called cell post cells. Um, and... <laughs> So never mind. This is just the the images that, for some reason, don't stay on their tab. Here you go. Um, so here, if if I go to the cell post cell tabs, um, you can see the a crop of each of the detected cells. Um, we can order these cells by file name or by category. Uh, right now we have no categories for the uh, for the objects uh, for the cells. And you can also um, order them at random, which I actually suggest in this case otherwise, because in this in these images, uh, first the control images are loaded. 
which if we open up, this is something that I didn't do before, uh, but you can see that control images have the GFP labeling mostly in the cytoplasm, whereas if we go to the all the way to the positive control, to the ones that have, uh, well, actually it's easier if I do this. This is something that I haven't uh, shown before, but you have uh, um, filtering options here on the side. So if you don't want to see all the categories, and but just one, you can, yeah, okay. So I'm just seeing the, uh, the categories that have 150 nanomolar uh, warming, which are the contr uh, positive controls. And you can see in these images that the GFP is in the nucleus, as I told you before. So when you go to the, to the objects, uh, I suggest um, ordering at random, otherwise, uh, they are. There'll be all the negative controls first, and the positive on the positive controls at the end, and you'll have to scroll a lot. Um, oh, I see a question. Uh, will it be possible to train a model directly through Pixime and then run the model on other images in batch? I don't have a GPU in my computer. Yes, actually, that is something that uh, in a few minutes we will train a classifier model, and you can then. Um, export that classifier module to your computer to for them to upload it to a, a server or perform inference on the cloud on uh, on some paid service. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so now we have all these uh, detected uh, cells, that, all these detected objects, and what we want to do is to uh, classify them. And so first for classification, we need to come up with the categories that we want to classify them in um, so that we can label a few of the objects to then train our classifier. So I'll create three categories. Uh, you can, you always get a color tag assigned at random. I particularly don't like the, the black one because you can see it in, in the background of the of the image. So I will create three categories, one that is called cytoplasmic GFP or cytoGFP, one that is nuclear GFP. And because these are uh, these cells have been transfected, not all of them are necessarily expressing the GFP tagged uh, protein. So I'll create also a category that is no GFP. So what we have to do now is to uh, hand label a few of these. So for that, you just click on the, the ones that you like. I'm starting with the no GFP images. Uh, you can scroll to find once you like, these are dim, but classify as non-GFP. And here you can see how many you are uh, you are choosing. I suggest for, for starters, uh, do like 20 objects for, for each, um, each category. So now that I have 20 selected, I can go to categorize and just click on no GFP and you can see immediately that they've been labeled. Now I'll unselect all and I'll start labeling the um, cytoplasmic GFP ones. Again, this is not all black and white. There will be situations in which you are not sure yourself if this is a, a cytoplasmic GFP or a nuclear GFP, that's fine. Uh, you can come with a, you can come up with a, um, uh, a criterion uh, to say whether you consider it as such or not. And even hopefully the model will lear learn your criterion and take the same decisions. So when I reach 20, uh, I categorize as cytoGFP. 
Um, finally, we have to do the nuclear GFP. One thing that you might have noticed is that since we don't have a separate cytoplasmic marker other than the um, labeled uh, the GFP labeled protein, when the protein is completely nuclear, or sorry, the label is completely nuclear, we don't see the rest of the cell. We only see the nucleus. Um, that is, and that is what uh, cell pose found out as a cell. It's just the nucleus because it's the only thing labeled. So uh, ideally, uh, to uh, it would be better if we had a separate independent uh, cytoplasmic marker. But for this, I think it's more than enough. So in some of these images, you can see both the magenta and the green um, fluorescence being together. Actually, they are kind of um, shifted from one to the other, which is likely uh, an artifact of the acquisition. But we can use that to our advantage because it makes it easier to see when the two uh, labels are superimposed. Um, you don't need to have the exact same uh, criterion as me for classifying. Uh, this is, have fun with this and decide whether or not I'm being silly. Uh, so I reached 20 and finally I classify them as nuclear GFP. So now we see that we have uh, a little over uh, 3,500 3, uh, objects that are unknown, but we have 20 labeled in each category. With this, uh, I think it will be enough to try and uh, start training uh, a classifier model. To do that, we go to the classification uh, tab. Um, and in this case, we are not going to load the model because the model is preloaded. Um, so you oh you can uh, upload uh, a model that you have trained before in in Pixime or or otherwise. But in this case, uh, we are going to use the 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 options that are um, already loaded into. Pixime. So if we want to pre-process in settings, um, you have, uh, oh, no, sorry, not this. The architecture settings, this is what we we want to, um, to change. Right now, currently, we have two options for classification, a uh, simple CNN, which is a fully conv convolutional uh, model, or a uh, mobile net, which is a uh, a lighter version. Um, for this, uh, we will be using simple CNN. Uh, yes, August, I can go back and show you. So after doing all the, the categorization, I went to the classification task here and then uh, go to the fit model options. Cool. Yeah. Uh, if anyone else uh, is lost, also uh, the um, I, I neglected the slides, but the the slides uh, are doing more or less all the things that I'm doing right now. Uh, so this is the. Oh, actually, I I because I I was not following the slides. I actually. Uh, skipped a step, which uh, is okay. Um, so right now we are in here, categorize the segmented cell. So you go to classification, uh, the fit classifier model. Um, going back, something that I just realized I hadn't done. Oh. Uh, Let's see all my images again. Um, something that that we hadn't done is we hadn't checked the the segmentation of 
our cell phones run. So once you have, oh, we kind of uh, saw it here that, okay, yeah, this looks like a cell, this looks like a nucleus, but we can also go to the, and um, choose all the images that we want and go to the annotation. And we can actually see what uh, cell process annotation looks like, and we can uh, fix it. For example, in this case, in which uh, I'm going to be using the selection tool, in this case, cellpost found uh, two objects or two cells, actually three, when there is actually just one. So one thing that you can do is you can select all these uh, three, delete them, and then uh, just maybe using this, fix that. Well, not that much. And uh, hand curate your your segmentation. Here is the same. This is a, a cell that it missed. We can apply and uh, fix the the annotations. Um, the ones in red. Oh, okay. The ones uh, in red and blue are the ones that we have classified, uh, we have labeled ourselves, no, not this, this right here. Right now in this image, you can see that uh, three of the cytoplasmic GFPs that we labeled correspond to this, uh, this image. Well, also we have one that was classified or tagged by us as a nuclear GFP. And for this, we can maybe this is not the, the best tool for that because it's touching others. So I can just go and do this for this cell. This is just me playing around with some of the, the annotation tools. OK. You can do this as much or as little as you want. Uh, and once you're happy with this, of course, you can export all your annotations if you uh, want to share it with someone else or you want to um, open this in some other tool. And when you go back, it will ask you if you want to save your changes. In my case, yes. And so we can get uh, back on track here to the categorize the segmented cells. So uh, we've gone to the segmented objects. Uh, we opened the classification tab. We created the categories and assigned. Here I said 40. Then I changed my mind. Now I'm, I say 20. Do as many or as, as few as you want, because then we will be uh, adding more to, to those uh, in the retraining of the model. And now we are going to uh, fit classifier model. Is everyone still on track with me? Okay. Um, so if we go to architecture settings, I told you we have two possible architectures. We are choosing simple CNN. And here is um, you have to decide on the number of input rows and columns that the, the images will be um, or the data for these images will be uh, re resized to. Um, you can go uh, as high or, or as little as you want. Of course, the the higher numbers will probably uh, give the the more information or like uh, lose less information from the the image. But we've seen that uh, doing 40, 48 by forty eight is uh, light enough and informative enough for, for this. But this can go as high as the dimensions of your image. Uh, a number of input channels, three. Um, in this optimizer, set, optimizer settings, uh, in the documentation, you can read a little more about uh, what this implies. You don't necessarily have to change them. Uh, 
what I will say is um, the epochs are the number of iterations that you um, that you will run on the training and on each tra training round. And uh, you can make this higher if you want to do less rounds manually, but you will see that uh, 10 can be enough. And if not, it's very easy to do more than 10. Uh, Shireen, you're stuck in annotation step. Uh, oh, due to unstable connection. Okay. Um, yeah, I can show it again when you when you come back. We are just uh, a few people, so we can make this uh, more of a conversation. Um, so yes, do let me know if you are able to catch up or if when if you're. Uh, connection gets better uh, and you are back on track and you want me to rewind a little bit, it's no problem. Um, so basically the only thing I changed here was the input, uh, the number of input rows and columns. Uh, and the rest you can leave as, uh, as default. And once all that is set, we just hit bit classifier and we should see the magic happening. Okay, of course, because this is a live demo, this happens. So uh, when, when you hit a uh, bit classifier, you will see these um, plots appearing, uh, which is the, oh, I thank you, Beth. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, so because I, I went back and forth, uh, Beth just uh, let me know that I am trying to classify the images and not the cells because I was uh, standing in the image level. So she's right. I was, I basically was going to classify the images based on this uh these labels rather than classify the cells based on these labels. Thank you. So very important, as I said here, first go to navigate to the tab of segmented objects and then do all the rest. Don't be like me. Um, so now we are in the correct place. We can try to fit model since I have some training data here, but this training was not what I wanted. Currently, there is not um, a button to forget the training or to restart the training. Um, there will be very shortly, but the one way to do it is to momentarily change the model architecture, because when you do, um, PixieMe will ask you if you want to keep the training history and you have the option to discard it. And then it's just a matter of going back to simple CNN. A bit hacky, I know, but uh, this is what works for now. Soon we will have uh, a button to just forget the training. So now we should be uh, able to fit the training classifier for our images. And so, yes, so as, as I was saying before, we have these, these two plots. The first one is plotting the uh, accuracy and the other is the loss function. In very general terms, you want your accuracy to be high and your loss to be uh, low. Each of these dots represents uh, an epoch of the training. Again, we train for 10 epochs, so we have 10 data points for each plot. Um, and in each one, you have two, two sets of points. The blue ones are uh, the validation. So when this is something that we didn't change, but when you get your set of labels, uh, here you we told the the classifier to set aside, um, use only seventy five percent or 0. 0.75 of the total um, of the total labeled images. Uh, use only 75 for the training and separate 
25% of those images for uh, validation so that we are uh, validating our model in some data that the, the model have hasn't ever seen. So this is what that means. Uh, this is the validation accuracy. This is how it performs on uh, the images that it has never seen. And the accuracy uh, is uh, how it performs on the training data. Esteban, there's a question in the chat. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, not sure you have to understand. Uh, OK, are you training a new model from scratch here, or are you improving an already existing model with your new annotations? Um, Beth, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm. I think we are training a model from scratch here. Yes, thank you. Woo. Um, yes, and the idea uh, that why we chose so few, uh, so few labels or so few um, ground truths to start with, is because we are going to do this iteratively with uh, a human in the loop approach, which. Uh, is much faster so that you don't have to uh, hand annotate uh, hundreds or, or thousands of images. So um, so this is what, what we have so far. We can uh, hit fit classifier again, and it will run another 10 epochs. And you can see how the, the model uh, keeps improving slightly or eventually just reaching um, a plateau. And we can. Uh, I think for, for now, this is better. At least we are performing, the model is performing better uh, at the end than at the beginning. Now, having done that, we can, uh, I'll do this because it's annoying. Um, we have a new option uh, available, which is uh, evaluate model. Uh, and so if you click there, you can see uh, this confusion matrix of um, basically the what the ground truth was saying versus what the prediction is saying. Ideally, you would have uh, a perfect diagonal here and nothing on the on the other sides of the diagonal. We are not doing too too bad. We can see that, um, and this is the the confusion matrix is built on the validation data. So on that 25% of images that were set aside and the model never never saw. So we see that uh, all the, the six images that our model is predicting as no GFP are actually no GFP. However, uh, and all of the cyto, the, the models that it's predicting, predicting a site of GFP are actually site of GFP. However, the prediction is having some confusion and uh, predicting some cyto GFP as nuclear GFP. Um, but we can try to improve that. Uh, everyone been able to follow so far? Anyone uh, want me to uh, go over anything so far? OK, please uh, keep the questions uh, flowing in the chat. Please and thank you. Um, so now we uh, can see. Oh, sorry. Um, this is what the the model is is doing right now. But so this is a a good place to start. So let's try and uh, run prediction uh, using that model on all our images. So far, we've only been doing it on the few images that we've selected for training. So. If we hit predict model, it will hopefully start predicting. And it's done predicting very soon. So here we see that uh, the um, objects previously classified as unknown have been split in one of these three categories. Uh, and we can check those. You can use the label colors to, to see what each image is. Image was selected as, or you can just filter. And so, for example, we can filter and see only the ones that were um, classified as no GFP. We can, if you don't want, we can uh, unsee the training and validation. So the ones that we have previously labeled uh, do not appear here. 
And so you can see that mostly is doing a good job uh, labeling the, the non-GFP cells. But we can see here like this and this, for example, have cytoplasmic GFP. This is dim, but also has cytoplasmic GFP. So if you find some of these, uh, these errors, you can reclassify them uh, manually. Mm, there are not that many, actually. Uh, the same way we did before. You select those, you go to categorize, and now you want to say, no, no, these are not no GFP, these are cytogfp, and they will disappear from here. Same way, for example, this and this, uh, I'm looking for images that are actually nuclear GFP. This is nuclear GFP, and this is likely also nuclear GFP. So I can recategorize them as nuclear GFP. And we can go uh, through the other uh, categories the same way. So right now, I'm, I'm seeing the nuclear GFP category. And I can see, for example, this seems more like a cytoplasmic GFP. Uh, this is a tweener, but these look like more like cytoplasmic GFP. And we know that the um, nuclear GFP mislabeling some cytoplasmic GFP was the biggest issue, at least in our confusion matrix. So this is where we expect, or I would expect to have uh, to do more corrections. So you can just add a few more, categorize them as cytogfp. I don't think we have any image here that is actually should belong to no GFP. I haven't seen any so far. And we finally did the same thing for the, the ones class, classified as cytogfp. So far, uh, everyone following along? Just to check, we are in the settings. We are here at the visually inspect and classificate, uh, visually inspect the classification and refined the model. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so. Right now we are in the cytoplasmic GFP and uh, let's see. Well, this is cytoplasmic and nuclear. I don't know. That's where your uh, criterion comes into place. But this is definitely nuclear. This is definitely nuclear. Uh, I just want to find a few to show you. OK. Uh, this is definitely nuclear, nuclear. So. Now I've uh, relabeled some of the categories and I would like to uh, train to use this uh, new, new information to retrain my model better. Um, when you do that, first you need to uh, clear the predictions. That When you clear the predictions, you will uh, get rid of the predictions that the classifier made, not the, the ones that you labeled manually. So uh, because we are we don't agree with these current predictions, we want to make new predictions. So before training the feeding the model again, we will clear the predictions. And you can see that the, the labelings that we did manually have not been cleared. So right now, we started with 202020, 20, 20, and we have now like 40 or 39 cytogfp, 26 nuclear, and 20 no GFP because we actually didn't recategorize any into the no GFP. Um, so now if we go to fit model again, we can continue feeding from where we stopped before. And you will see that likely this uh generates some some noise. So our uh, model will at first start performing worse than before because again this was performing really well with the training and validation sets that it had before but now we added more 
uh, objects to the to the training set. Um, we can try to hit fit classifier again one more time. Ooh, okay. That this is not what you want to see. Uh, let's see if it goes back. This is something that can happen, uh, and if you've ever trained a uh, a deep learning model, uh, you know when at the start of training the some of the 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 assignment of the ways of the model and in which way the the ways are changed are random. So by chance you might uh, reach a state in which is very hard to improve. Uh, and so this is what might be happening right now. And I might be, I might need to redo uh to redo the training. But just to to check, we can see evaluate the model. And indeed we see that we are classifying everything as a side of GFP. This is not what we want. So if this happens, again, one way to do it. And any time that you have this plateau and does not change when you fit uh, a classifier, and especially if it's not plateauing in a high accuracy and a low loss, uh, this is probably what you need to, to do. Um, so I can forget all my previous training and then fit it again. This is the, the same trick that I did before to change the architecture just to uh, just to get rid of the training history. And so right now, because also we are starting from a, a better uh, training set, uh, we see that this uh, accuracy and the loss are evolving much, much better. And if we go to evaluate the model, uh, we see it is similar to what it was before. So the idea here is that you can make this human in the loop training to uh, fit a classifier, predict, see in which cases the prediction uh, was performing poorly and manually classify those uh, edge cases because it, the, the ones it, it is performing poorly it's most likely the, the the cases that are more difficult to classify, and then uh, fit in again. So with a few rounds of that, hopefully you would come to a, a, a classification model that is um, is good enough. Once you reach that, you have to accept these predictions. Uh, and so here it says hold. Um, this is just so that so you don't. Uh, accept predictions by by chance. So you need to click and hold the click there for a few seconds. And then and only then will these predictions be set in stone. Uh, OK, so we have uh, segmented ourselves and we have classified ourselves. The next thing that we want to do is to make measurements. So to do this, uh, there's a, a little option right here on the top, which is measurements. And if we go there, we'll see this blank page and we need to uh, add some measurement tables. We can add uh, measurements based on the whole image or based on the uh, objects that we segmented and classified. Um, contrary to... Uh, what would be expected, I will first create a, a table for images for two main reasons. First, because it will be much faster. You will see that measurements do take some time to compute. Uh, so it created the table, but the table is empty. So we will have to tell which um, which measurements do we want to perform? And the reason that the measurements are not uh, automatically performed is because, again, as I told you, uh, they take some time to to calculate. So, if they uh, if Pixime calculated everything 
even things that you may not need uh, beforehand, it would be inefficient. Uh, so in this case, uh, the, the measurements uh, section is the, the, the latest addition to Pixime. So uh, it's relatively limited what you can um, you can measure right now. For images, we have intensity-based measurements, total intensity, so the sum of the intensities of all the pixels for the different channels. Um, the mean intensity, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and the quartile. So in this case, I will, again, to uh, for this to be faster, I will only do the total intensity of channel one, uh, in this case, in my images, channel one corresponds to the green channel. So that is the channel that I'm uh, most interested in um, because it is only one thing and it's on the images, which are 17 rather than the objects that are over 3000. This was quite fast. Uh, and I can uh, divide these measurements by category. Yeah. Thank you, Fabian, for, for participating. Uh, and so now we see that the this table was uh, filled with the measurements, uh, the name of the measurement, the split, so which category they belong to, uh, and the mean, median, and star deviation for this measurement. Uh, again, well, Remember that we had four images for the negative control for zero Wormanian, and we had uh, also four images for 150. So you can see here uh, that we are seeing just the the summary statistics for for all of those. If you want to see the individual uh, measurements for all the images, you uh, need to export this data and you will get a, a CSV uh, with the detailed uh, data. Uh, but the reason I wanted to do the, the the measurements is so we can plot them. So if we go to this other plot uh, tab, we have three different kinds of plots that we can make. In this case, I want a swarm plot. You can uh, choose the color theme that you like best, and then choose the which measurements to use. In this case, I only performed one measurement, so this is the only option. But if I if I did more here, uh, I will have more options. Uh, and in this case, how you want to uh, organize this uh, the the x axis, for example, in partition you have training validation, uh, you can see it that way, but I think it's better if you uh, do the partition by category, which are, again, our categories are all the different doses of warming in. Uh, and so here you can see a nice curve or a nice -ish curve in which, uh, the you can see the more the higher the dose of warmanin, the lower the total intensity of the green channel is. And we can actually add some statistics here, some box plotting um, to uh, to visualize this even better. So why so this is kind of what we were aiming for at the beginning. We wanted to see. Uh, what was the dose of warmanin that started uh, having an effect on these cells? But why are we seeing this on the uh, on the total intensity for the green channel in the whole image and not on the uh, individual objects that we took so much care and effort to segment and classify? Um, there are two answers to that. One, we are seeing uh, a curve here because warmanin is slightly toxic so when you uh the higher the dose of warmanin the lower the number of cells and the lower the number of cells statistically the lower the total intensity of the green channel you will have so what we are seeing here is actually the toxicity of of warmanin but this is so 
that you just uh, get to see this, this nice curve. The other thing I told you, uh, these are just the image measurements, but we can also add object measurements. So measurements uh, made in each one of the segmented and classified objects. And I just did that, and this will probably take uh, a bit longer. You see this little uh, this little wheel uh, filling up. So um, that takes a, a few minutes. So as I told you, the um, measurements were the the last thing to be implemented. So there there are several things that uh, are being actively uh, developed here, and. One of the things is uh, that, unfortunately, right now we cannot uh, divide the objects based on the labels of the images. And that will make sense in a moment. So we have the, the new table here. And now you see that we have different options for uh, images and objects. Images, we can only make intensity measurements, whereas objects, we can do both intensity and geometry measurements, so based on the shape of the, the segmentation. Uh, we can maybe calculate the area of the of our objects. Again, you see this goes uh, a little bit slower than for cells. And then we can also try to calculate the total intensity in, uh, or rather the mean intensity in channel one. While this is going, I know this is will take some time and that's why I prepared uh, this in more information to fill in the gap. And so we don't, uh, we don't leave this demo uh, without mentioning. Um, we have a preprint of Fixime uh, available. Uh, if you want more information, please check it out. Uh, and this is something that I mentioned before, but the, one of the, I think the very cool things about Pixime and running on the, uh, on a web app, as a web app, is that it works on mobile devices. So this is literally my phone uh, with Pixime open, and you can do exactly the same things that we are doing. And this is very useful for uh, using uh, a tablet to uh, do manual annotations. It's much, at least in my experience, it's uh, much easier uh, and nicer to do than uh, on the on a laptop with a mouse. Uh, we, of course, have uh, documentation that, again, also is um, under active development. And because this is all under active development, it is very, very useful for us if you can, uh, if you try the this this tool and found uh, find errors or find something that you would uh, like to be different or some uh, feature that you think might uh, be beneficial for for you or other people, um, you here's a link to the uh, to the GitHub repo to report the bugs and um, and request features. And last but not least, let's see. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is almost done. Uh, last but not least, um, you probably uh, have heard this before in in other tutorials here at Y two K, but uh, we have. Um, uh, a survey of image analysis users uh, active right now uh, that I will highly, highly encourage you to complete. It doesn't matter if you are an expert image analyst or you're just starting or uh, are just curious and, or, and you have only ever uh, work with a, a few images in your life, we still uh, uh, are interested in, in hearing what you want to say. And actually, probably the people who uh, feel more like beginners are the ones who are more likely to feel like they are not experienced enough to complete uh, an image analysis survey. So I think those are the people who we want to reach the most. Um, 
This survey is conducted by the Center of Open Bioimage Analysis, of, for which our lab uh, is part of, but also together with um, several other bioimaging societies, such as Bioimaging North America, the Royal Macroscopy Society, and uh, the Global Bioimage sorry, Analysis Society. Uh, it's a short survey. It takes only five to 15 minutes, and it really gives us a lot of, uh, or gives these societies a lot of information on how to um, uh, focus their efforts to make uh, these image analysis tools uh, and education more uh, accessible and more tailored to what the community uh, needs. So having said that, hopefully my uh, measurements are done. Uh, let me see. No, not yet. I knew this was going to take some time. So, uh, yeah, this is still going. Uh, so this is what, what I wanted to show you before in the, the splits or, or the categories in, in which I, I can split the, the data for, for plotting in the objects are not the same as, as the ones in, in image. So here we can classify them as whether they are cyto-GFP, nuclear GFP, and no GFP, but not on uh, based on what is on their metadata. So on their what the amount, what is the amount of warmanin that each of them uh, received. Uh, so we cannot compute this uh, dose response curve with the uh, object measurements yet. It's a it's a feature that it will that uh, the Andrea and other are actively working on and will be available shortly. Uh, yeah, but while this continues uh, computing, is there any questions? Something that you want me to go over? We have uh, I think ten more minutes or fifteen minutes. Um, so yeah, please write them in the chat or uh, let me know. Uh, let's see. No, I can't add the categories. Let's see if I can do this though. Yeah, no, it's it's not showing me anything because it hasn't finished yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this. Thank you, Sukanya, for sharing the the link to the survey. I really hope this gets done by the before our time is up. But again, the the same I I said before. This is probably one of the the downsides for uh, being able to do all of this uh, online and without installing anything. But again. Um, this is just to add more tools uh, and to to what's available, and you can do this with a, a small set of images and uh, either as a as a pilot to get an idea of how things are doing uh, and do it in a in a quick manner, or uh, to train and do the classification of your objects and then uh, perform your measurements somewhere else. You have uh, a question in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you talk again about how the classifier can be exported and used it elsewhere? Are other features one could integrate into a high throughput cloud-based pipeline? Yes, a great question. Um, okay, so I'll go back to the measurements. I'm pretty sure this doesn't uh, stop the calculation, but I think this is a, a more interesting question than seeing if this finally uh, gets done. So. After 
uh, doing your uh, training your 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 classification model and doing the the different rounds of uh, human in the loop training, you can save your your model uh, to your uh, to your PC and um, to be honest and Beth maybe chime in here I don't know exactly what uh, format this uh, model is saved as uh, so these this is saved as a tensorflow js model um, which you can use a tensorflow js converter to convert to standard tensorflow weights um, we have work in progress documentation on doing exactly that. It just needs to be updated because we changed a little bit how Pixami um, exports those weights. But in theory, it's just a single line command from TensorFlow.js converter to make a TensorFlow.js model into a TensorFlow model. Thank you so much. I couldn't have explained that as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, August, if that... Uh... I, I let me know if that answers your question. Uh, and the same the same way you can save your classification model, you can save your segmentation. Although as I show you before, right now you, we cannot uh, train the the available models. But for when you do, you will also be able to save the segmentation models in a similar fashion. Uh, let's see if measurements are actually done. Oh yeah, when it's, uh, okay, so today we learned that uh, if you are in the middle of calculating the the measurements and you get, get out of measurements, it will stop calculating them. Um, so yeah, I think it does not make sense to to try and, uh, and calculate this, this again. We still, uh, I can show you just a little bit more of things that you can do um, uh, for plotting-wise. Um, so uh, let's see. Just, uh, yeah, just to calculate another thing. Uh, again, in this case, we have limited uh, number of measurements, but uh, you can also plot the, for example, we were plotting the intensity of the y-axis based on category, and you can also add uh, the, the size of the marker as a different measurement. So for example, we are... Um, plotting total intensity, and we can use the size of the marker for max intensity. Um, yeah, maybe max intensity was the kind of similar. Maybe there's some saturation going on there because all of them had the same size. So let's try another thing. Uh, so the standard deviation. Well, there is some very minor differences in in size there uh, again you can also plot the histogram or a scatter plot of in this case total intensity versus uh sun deviation again these are just similar versions of this the same measurement so you can see they uh they are very well correlated with, within each other. Um, so yeah, again, uh, if anyone else has any other question, uh, otherwise I thank you so much for being here. Thank you, uh, Suganya and Beth for uh, for your assistance. And I, I plug once again uh, the survey please complete the survey and share it with your colleagues and uh, anyone you know that uh, works uh, analyzing images. Again, no matter uh, how experienced or inexperienced they, uh, they feel they are, uh, it's uh, very beneficial to the, the whole community to, to have this their input. Um, so with that, I think 
uh, we're just a teeny tiny bit earlier, but uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for participating, August. August, sorry, I'm probably butchering it. Uh, oh, so when to use the mobile net model? Uh, the mobile net classification, it's more lightweight, so it will probably uh, be easier to train. It's if you have a, a simpler classification, uh, a simple classification task, maybe the the mobile net model uh, is enough. But you, it's uh, it has a, a much lower number of weights, uh, so it is again easier and. Uh, easier to train, but will likely uh, not be able to perform as good as a mobile, uh, as a, the CNN for uh, more complex classification tasks. Yeah, and thank you for your questions. Please uh, keep asking if you keep having them. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, thanks Brittany for participating and uh, yeah, be on, on the lookout. Yeah, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want. Yes. Uh, just thank you so much. It's really helpful. Um, just have a question. Um, if I have a both uh, fluorescent, or fluorescent and uh, wide field imaging, can I use both and then to um, classify based on one into, um, and, sorry, let me think. So I can use in white bright field imaging, uh, transmitting imaging to segment the um, object and then, um, once I set my object, I can base on the different RGB values to mm. specify the different category. Yes. So, so uh, mm -hmm. you want to know if you can use bright field to do the segmentation, but then, but then use the fluorescent channels to do the classification, right? Yeah. So, um, yes. so I mean, it's a good question. I when you do the segmentation, one thing you can do is um, put like merge all the the channels. I don't know how many uh, fluorescent channels you have uh, in in this case. It's actually it's actually um, it's it's actually a camera. So I got the RGB. Uh, for rest imaging through RGB data set. Okay, so you're, you're, it's you're... Not, yeah, it's not a single. It's a it's a RGB. So I will separate into um RGB three different imaging in grayscale imaging. Um, and I also have a white bright imaging. Um, yes. Bright so, imaging. um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, and Beth, help me out here. Is uh, it, if there's a way to get these the segmentations out and then load them to another set of images? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think Beth is not in the call. So. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, I'm pretty sure you can like it right now. I don't think there's a super easy way to do that. If you have your your images separated. Um, yeah. You can try to merge all of them into into a single image. So, like merge all your fluorescent channels and the uh, the bright field, the bright field which can be probably converted to uh, an uh, an uh, eight bit 
uh, like merge them into just one image and use all the data, uh, all that information for both segmentation and classification. I know that's not ideal though. Um, right now, I don't think there's an easy way to do that in Pixime. It is certainly something that we want to do. Um, I think if you export the annotations here, mm. uh, and so you can, okay, yeah. Uh, you, you have different ways of exporting. So if you export as a label instant, instance max, instance mask, sorry. Mm. Uh, let me see. Actually, this is uh, interesting. Uh, you should be able to, let me check how they look like. Yeah, so this is uh, what it looks like. Um, so this is the what I just downloaded and you have for each image, uh, you have this cyber GFP, nuclear GFP, and no GFP. In this case, it's because we have these um, these objects already classified. If you haven't classified them and they are all uh, um, all unknown, mm. meaning this, you, you have all all these three colors of labels here. So that's why they are separating it. Um, you have it exported as a uh, as masks. Yeah. So, can you then uh, import an yeah. of some sort? I'm oh, sorry, not new. Uh, yeah, you can open annotations. Okay. So you should be able to do that. Sorry, I'm. Uh, you see. Yeah, I haven't actually ever done that. I wonder the same thing myself, uh, but it seems like you can. So, okay. Yeah. So I segment using the wide field, bright field imaging and then save as the masker. So it's going to yes. be a PNG file and then uploading and then uploading back to the Pixme. Yes, maybe you need to save them when you save, save them not as mask, yeah, uh, but as Pixime, Pixime formatted JSON. So mm -hmm. if I export these annotations and then let's do something fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to close this. Okay. Uh, I can choose all of these and delete all of them. So to, to just uh, get rid of the annotations and see if I can use uh it always do the same open annotations import pixime and here's mm -hmm. the pixime.json file uh yeah rejection okay uh i will see you can uh i encourage you to leave a question in the forum if you want and i'll see with the developers if this is a bug or, or if I'm actually doing something wrong here. Okay. Uh, and I can uh, reach out with you to you. Okay. With that. Otherwise, you can uh, I, you have the links to uh, make feature requests or report bugs uh, to the developers of Pixime. I see. Okay. I will write it. Down. Uh, here, there you have Suganya posted the, the link to the forum in the, in the chat. Thank you. I I see. Thank you, Nicole. Okay. Yeah. We'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, I will stop sharing now. Uh yeah, and thank you all for for being here. You know, uh live demos are uh can be a bit wonky. And but I think this I hope this was uh useful for you. Yeah, very useful. Thank you all for being here and participating.